Great. Um, we are so grateful that you're here with us tonight. Um, we uh, have been doing about every month uh, webinars um, ar around issues that are important to ECS teachers and also to those who are teaching the CS Principles course. And so we're so happy to have you with us as we're talking tonight about pseudocode and flow charting tools. And we've got some wonderful guests here um, that are going to be with us. Um, the, um, the American Institutes for Research is the organization that manages and hosts the CS10K community. And so if you're not already a member, if you're just following us on social media or happen to find out about this because someone else spread the word, we do hope you'll join us because we'll have lots of great things. And I'll share more about that at the end about all the things that you can see and do um, in the community. Um, our host, or I guess hostess for this evening is Deepa Moralda Hall, which many of you probably know already. So I'm going to hush and turn things over to her, but do know that if you have run into any issues like technical-wise or, or whatever, you're welcome to send me a private message or just put it in the chat window and I'll be sure to um, be glad to help you. So Deepa, I'll let you take things from here. Thank you, Melissa. Hi, everybody. Uh, this is Deepa Muralajar, and uh, we have done a couple of webinars before, so in many ways I'm no new stranger to you, but uh, just in case. Uh, I'm a high school teacher, like many of you here. Um, I have um, been were teaching for, this is my 16th year, and I have been an AP Computer Science and a CS Principles teacher and hope to be an AP CS Principles teacher the upcoming year. And um, uh, besides being a pilot, I'm also a member of the development committee for the first AP CS Principles exam that goes out live in 2016, 2017. Um, along with uh, Ria here, who is among the audience, I'm one of the co-founders for the Georgia CSTA, and I currently serve as president. So welcome, everybody. Uh, very excited to have an amazing esteemed set of guests out here today to discuss with us this really, really important topic for CS principles about pseudocodes and flowcharts as tools for teaching problem solving and algorithms. Uh, before I get into the topic, I'd really like to introduce our guests. I'd like to go through the slide deck and introduce all three of them, and then I'd like to hand over the floor to each one of them to just say a few things, their thoughts uh, about, about being in today evening, and then we'll get on to the meaty stuff. Um, Dan Garcia, he is our professor from uh, UC Berkeley. He is, he's no stranger to anybody in this. Uh, in this field here of computer science education. He's a co-developer of the Beauty and Joy uh, BJC curriculum, which is very popular across the nation. And they've been very successful, if I may say so. And they have worked over more than 200 teachers. Yes, I have the uh, really unique pleasure of being a co-development committee member in the APCS Principles Development Committee. And he's also an ACM Distinguished Educator. I also wanted to add that um, the CS10K webinar folks, uh, including the AIR and I, are very, very grateful to the BJC group because practically every single webinar we've had a guest from BJC, starting with Josh Paley to Brian Harvey to Tiffany Barnes to Dan Garcia. We are very grateful for your presence here. So thank you for your support. Next is Marcus Dial. Uh, anybody who does anything here uh, in the world of computer science education has to have read Mark's very popular blog, both on the ACM communications website as well as a blog that he writes on his own. Um, he's a founder of the ICER conference, an ACM Distinguished Educator and Fellow, and he invented the MediaCom contextualized approach to computing education. I personally am very familiar with the media, media comp methodology here in Georgia because Mark and I both, both uh, live out of Atlanta and were he works at Georgia Tech, and I'm a high school teacher here. Something that I would like to mention about Mark and his uh, extremely talented and uh, very involved wife, Barb Erickson, is we really here in Georgia are very grateful to Mark and Barb's work because, honestly, we in Georgia would not have been able to figure in the CS Ed map if it were not for their fantastic work. So welcome aboard, Mark. We are really grateful to have you here. And Jill Westerland, our high school teacher from Alabama. Jill has taught for 25 years. Um, she has teaching, you name it, computer science, AP computer science, uh, CS principles pilot. Uh, she does an IB computer science as well. 
and and uh, Jill has also been a member with the very popular CS for Alabama uh, project. Uh, we have they have held a very popular three-year program where they've trained teachers, over 50 teachers now, and many of them have become teacher leaders. And and Jill was one of the pioneers and an extremely successful one. And she's seriously no stranger to any teacher who has is very involved in computer science education, particularly with APCS principles. Uh, Jill is your one-stop shop for any information you need to know. Okay, um, Dan, I'd like to hand over the floor to you, sir, if you would like to say a few words to us. Uh, sure, this is Dan. I'm delighted to be here. I'm so glad, Deepa, that you invited uh, me to join the webinar. This is uh, a great chance. These, these webinars are great chances to serve the community, to share uh, different educators' views of the upcoming movement of CS principles. And I, I, I do you know, want to always put a plug in. If you know anybody, any school that's not teaching this, try to let them know about the existence of CS principles and lots of wonderful curriculum that's out there. Uh, to, to engage our students. This is really going to going to change and move the needle in a very significant way, hopefully in fall of 16 and spring of 17. So again, Deepa, thank you for, for inviting me and honor to be here. Great. Thanks, Dan. Mark. Hi, everybody. Pleased to be here. Um, I've been involved in CS principles since the beginning. I was on the original commission that tried to come up with the, uh, the big ideas and thinking practices. And, um, they, they've evolved a lot since since I was involved. Uh, this is my first time to be on a uh, CSP webinar, and I'm looking forward to it. Thanks for having Great. me, Deepa. Thank you, Mark. Jill. Hey, everyone. Um, I'm Jill from Alabama. You won't you won't miss me on the um, list. I sound a little bit different than everyone else, but um, it's wonderful to be here with you. Um, I'm completely committed to um, watching our CSP um, become APCSP next year. It's like watching a child, you know, grow up into their own. It's just very exciting. So um, um, I'm happy to be here and share with you. Great. Thank you so much, Jill. So jumping right in uh, into our topic here, uh, pseudocode and flowcharts are very popular tools that are well-known tools that can be used to teach problem solving and algorithms. So it's no surprise that when we deal with a course like the computer science principles, which claims itself to be very language agnostic, you tend to lean towards one of these tools to teach it each problem solving. So you can go completely language independent. But is this the right approach? And if there is one, which one would it be? Or is there a totally different tool? Or if not, if, if either of these don't work, then how do we go about teaching problem solving, algorithm development, in a language agnostic way? That, that's really the crux of the question. Let's not forget that APCS Principles has a pseudocode reference sheet. Now, how do we use this? What is the role that this particular reference sheet plays in the course? That is different, right, from the pseudocode and flowcharts, which are just tools for teaching. So, so these are things to ponder about, and these are challenges that I face in my classroom as I teach. And having taught APCSA for for 16 odd years, I have found flowcharting to be very, very useful and convenient to teach both conditionals and iterations. Pseudocode is good. It's a little more cumbersome and a little frustrating for a high school student, but they do do it, and it definitely appeals to some students, especially the ones who struggle to get the compiler errors away. So moving to our first question here. What role do you think pseudocode and flowchart should play in a CS principles classroom? Uh, Dan, could you talk to us a little bit about this? I'd be delighted. Um, let's, you, know, you brought up a lot of interesting points uh, when you were kind of introducing this, this segment. Um, even though the exam is, and the course is language agnostic, I think the reality is that each teacher is going to find 
you know, the most engaging language that works with their students, if that's App Inventor, if that's Snap, if that's Scratch, if that's Python. Um, and hopefully it'll be a language that's really easy to learn. So this is my personal opinion. I hope it's not Java. Java has shown to not really engage the, the group of the diversity of the community uh, in APA. So I, hope it's a, I hope it's a really engaging language for the students. Um, there is a pseudocode reference sheet. So just to, just to be clear, the word pseudocode is overloaded. The pseudocode is used in talking about algorithms and there's a pseudocode reference sheet. And I think that let's, I want to just bring up some clar clarity for, for myself and maybe for the audience. Um, the reference sheet, I think of the reference sheet, this is me taking off my CS Principles Development Committee hat and just being a, a teacher looking at it. I think of that reference sheet as um, kind of a, the intersection of all the language features that, that, that are being used in the languages that are being taught out there in the, in the community. So it's, I don't think of that as so much pseudocode. I actually think of that, I actually wrote a word for it. I, I call it the minimalist imperative programming language. Because um, I think of it actually as a programming language, and I think of it as, as an intersection of all the kind of common features you're seeing that students will see. And part of the reason, now putting my hat back on, the reason for that pseudocode reference sheet was so that the exam doesn't, isn't onerous in terms of a lot of reading for a little teeny question. By having kind of this programming language that's given to the teachers in advance, they can all, and, all, and the students in advance, they can look at that and then when they see a question, they don't have to kind of understand, oh, what are the new semantics of this particular problem? They can understand that and they can play with it and they can go over exercises with that. So just to be clear, I, I don't think of that actually reference sheet as a pseudocode reference sheet as much. I think of it as a minimalist programming sheet that's kind of trying to make everybody happy in terms of finding um, a language that, that seems to be have most, some of the most common constructs. Um, how, now, to the actual question, what do I think pseudocode in the purest sense uh, and flowchart should play in the CS Principles classroom? Um, I, I think of uh, pseudocode as, you know, when you're doing top-down development, when you're designing an algorithm, uh, and every algorithm book has pseudocode in it, um, when you're doing top-down development, let's start at the top. Okay, so you're going to read input from the user, you're going to process the input, and you're going to then display the output to the user. Each of those lines is pseudocode. Each of those lines is kind of a promise for blocks and procedures that you'll write in the future. So now let's go into the, what the processing block might look like. Well, that's going to be, okay, you need to um, filter it, throw out some bad data, you need to try to find some clusters, you need to try to you know, coordinate it in some way, maybe, maybe reverse, reverse map it, do some processing to it. So each one of those are other blocks that you'll write, write in the future. So kind of the top-down development, which is really a, a useful way to think of things for many students, um, pseudocode is a nice way to put a placeholder, right? It's a very, the actual, it's kind of, it's more about the what and less about the how, right? It's more declarative in that sense. You know, the what is, we're going to process the input. How I do it, ah, I'll deal with it tomorrow. <laughs> Wonderful. I, I, there's a screaming noise that just comes in every while, but just me. Um, uh, on the sound, anybody else hear that just now? Just like, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Came by. Um, mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so I think of pseudocode as useful if you're working with students who have a large, a big problem they're trying to solve and say, well, let's break it down to pieces. Tell me how you do it in English. And whatever they're saying to you in English, you write that down. And if it has three or four lines, each one of those lines is pseudocode. It's the way you're going to, well, that's how, it's what you want to do, but less, less about the how. Okay, so I think of pseudocode as useful if you have big algorithms. Um, Flow charts are useful if you've got a lot of data that you're flowing around. So in the, you know, you're doing big idea three data, you know, let's say there is quite a complicated route and a complicated route of where the data is flowing your system. I think a flow chart is really useful in a data flow sense. Not necessarily in the flow chart, the traditional flow chart sense where you're teaching them what a triangle, what a diamond means, that the diamond is a, is a you know, if then branch and a square box means something and a kind of slanted rhombusy thing looks like something else. I don't think of it that way. I think of flowcharts, when I work with students one-on-one uh, -on -one in my BJC class, um, I think of flowcharts as useful to kind of help them navigate the way data is going to flow through the system. But um, to, 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 to be clear, in BJC, we don't teach pseudocode directly. I think that the, the or flowcharting, I think the problems that students will see in the exam and the problems students do work with in terms of the BJC projects are small enough that you don't have to have kind of the software engineering formalism that comes with pseudocode. Other than, you know, please do write down, if it helps you to think about what you want to do, write them down. 
but in terms of teaching them what pseudocode is, I just say, hey, look, anytime you write English words for what a thing is going to be do, that's pseudocode. And so that's, that's literally the level we teach pseudocode. If you need to kind of think about writing on paper and you write an English sentence for what you're going to do at some stage, that's called pseudocode, and that's a wonderful way to do that. But we don't ever formally teach them other than say that, you know, we obviously, we obviously model things, so I'll work with them and we'll describe an algorithm, and I might even do that kind of thing. But I do much more than model it once or twice in front of them, and we certainly don't do flow charting. Thank you, Dan. I have a, two couple of questions from the audience. Chris has a question. Um, I open it up to Mark, Dan, or Jill. Um, how, what about OO design, Chris asks. How do we use pseudocode? Pseudocode is mostly a procedural effort, approach. What do you use for OO object-oriented design? Here at Georgia Tech, um, we use UML when yeah. we're teaching OO design, but uh, we don't teach OO design in the intro course. Great. Um, there is another question. Dan, I'd like for you to help me confirm this. Um, there's a question by Jean. Where can I find the pseudocode reference sheet? I cannot find it on the College Board website. I believe, Jean, it is on the APCS Principles Discussion Forum. So you need to become a community member, but I think you should be able to download it. Uh, Jill seems to think it's not been published and that's a possibility. Dan, would you be able to say one way or the other? Uh, you, and I, you and I have the, the same role, the same title in the principal growth. <laughs> I thought it had been released. I thought it had been released when, I, when, when we released the, um, the performance tasks, the performance task rubrics. I thought it was part of the, three, the trio that the pseudocode ever see also was released. Um, okay. Thanks but, for the uh, And I see that Rhea said I've seen it. So. Maybe, maybe, maybe Rhea can give us a pointer for where she found it. Right. Um, I think on... it's out. I don't know that it's on website. This is Jill. I think that some people have it, but I don't know that it's, like, on the front of any kind of website yet, you know? This is Mark. I just posted a link to it on the website. I found it just by Googling around. Good. Okay, great. Thank you, I just you, did a search for oh. CS Principles Reference Sheet. <laughs> I see. Uh, Grant has a question. Um, so flowcharting is not useful in this type of a course. Um, Jill, you want to take this one? What did he say? So there's a question Sorry, from Grant about... Hutchinson. So flowcharting is not useful in this type of a course, like as in, do you not think that this uh, flowcharting would be useful in CS principles? For my class, this is Jill, and I teach um, high school students um, CS principles. I, in my CS principles class, I couch every coding project with a flowchart. I have sort of a mix of students. Many of them have not had a lot of computer science before, maybe none, and um, you know, lots of diversity and lots of backgrounds. And so, it's easy for me to put up a flow chart on my display screen. Sometimes I even print one off um, that I've hand drawn, you know, with a start button and an operation button and maybe I draw in a loop and then together we fill in what might go in these items in the flow chart and then they do a snap project to accomplish that. Um, I have found in my classroom that it works well to sort of um, give students a a structure to follow and then let them fill in the blanks in a creative way, whether they're going to draw something or do math or um, you know, have the, the program interact with the user by asking for input and giving an answer. So um, I use flowcharts completely all the way through CS principles and require them to do them many times on their own. Pseudocode, in terms of my students writing pseudocode in CS principles, I haven't done a lot of that. Um, I tend to do more of that in my CSA course. Um, but I believe the, the word pseudocode, as it's used with the reference sheet, then, you know, like the exam reference sheet is more like what Dan was saying. It's sort of a, a concept. You know, here is a way to talk about an if statement or something. So, um, so yes, I use flowcharts um, pretty much all the way through um, because it's helpful for me to get down to a basic level and kind of connect everybody um, 
because I do have a variety of skill sets and, you know, meet people kind of where they are. Um, Chris has a specific question. Jill, do you use any pseudocode or flowchart for a do now or exit ticket? I, I don't even know what you mean. Not like that. leave the classroom exit? Yeah, I, I, think I don't think I do. Uh -huh. Yeah, I don't think I do it as an exit ticket. I do it more as a to wrap their mind around where they're going with their project. It's sort of how I do mine, right. if that makes sense. Well, uh huh. Yes, it does. So thank you so much, uh, Jill. And the next question that I thought would be of useful for us to discuss is: Let's say we did decide to use pseudocode. As researchers and practitioners who you have thought extensively about this and you've practiced and tried to analyze, I'd like to listen to your, your thoughts on the advantages and the disadvantages of using pseudocode. While I'd like everybody to piggyback off and talk about this, Mark, would you please take the lead on this? Hello. Sorry, forgot to unmute. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, we, we just heard from Jill some of the advantages of uh, using pseudocode, that you can provide a structure to the students before they get started. Um, some of my students have done research in this area. Um, they, they don't necessarily use the term pseudocode. They talk about providing sub-goals that you can provide sub-goals to students to give them a sense of where they're going to fill in the blanks as Jill has described. Um, another advantage that people talk about using pseudocode for is that you avoid syntax errors. Um, you get no compiler errors or syntax errors if you never expect to execute the code. And pseudocode, um, for, for most people's definition, you can look it up in Wikipedia, um, pseudocode is not supposed to be executable. Um, disadvantages of pseudocode, um, are that it's yet another notation. It's something else for the students to learn. And it's not directly tied necessarily to how the computer works. Um, it's pretty easy when you're writing pseudocode to have lines that are essentially, and magic happens here. Um, pseudocode isn't necessarily bound to um, existing languages, existing functions, even what a computer is capable of doing. Um, so I think that those are some rough advantages and disadvantages. Uh, do my the fellow pan panelists want to fill in gaps? Yeah. Um, in a minute, uh, Ria had one comment that I'd like to. I thought it was pretty cool. Uh, Ria says one disadvantage would be to make every student go through the process, even if they don't need it. And that I think is absolutely right. Uh, anybody wants to elaborate on that, uh, Jill? Do you think of any advantages? Deanne, would you want to expand on this there? I can speak. Um, I, I agree with her. I think the the um, the interaction that you have with your class kind of lets you know who's going to need more of you know of lines to drive in between and who's not. So I totally agree with that. Um, I think um, pseudocode to me. The way that I have my kids do it a lot of times is I have them print their code, usually when it's completed, and literally handwrite over on the right-hand side what is happening in this method or what's happening in this loop, you know, in English. So, um, and sometimes we might do it beforehand, you know, like you're saying to do, you know, what's going to happen. But a lot of times, um, especially if we're doing SNAP, they just want to get the blocks and see what works and, and run it. It's so um, snap and, and even pencil code, they're so user friendly and there's such immediate feedback and there's no, you know, gnashing of teeth, you know, when you're trying to deal with errors as much, you know, as in Python or Java, certainly not Java. So um, a lot of times they just want to play with the code and get somewhere and then at the end of the class period, I would like to hear them tell me, in their own words, what happened here? What did you do? And so that's sort of how I use pseudocode in my room. 
um, as opposed to how I use flow charts when we're about to start something that's a little bit more involved. So, um, you know, I don't know if that sort of falls in with anyone else in the way they use it. So, Dan, you can kind of jump in. Yeah, no, you brought up a good point with SNAP, which is that um, one of the advantages of it is that um, you, it, unlike many programming languages, you can put spaces and words and you can get the arguments in the middle rather than having to have long function name here, open paren, argument, 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 right? It doesn't usually read very well, but you can actually have a sentence, you know, insert item of list, and there's the item and the list. So one of the things that's really nice about SNAP, and you mentioned the students just want to start writing, well, I almost think that as if you're doing top-down development, why not have, make three blocks that read like English? And so in some sense, SNAP, because you can put the arguments anywhere and add spaces and have full sentences, you can have, you can actually have the block serve as pseudocode in some sense. And Mark was saying one of the nice things about pseudocode is that there's no syntax errors. And again, this is a, the family of block-based languages. There aren't syntax errors in block-based languages um, that you see. In, you know, I missed a semicolon. I missed this. It doesn't work. You know, if, it, if, if, the, if the block fits in the hole, the block fits in the hole, and things should you know, make sense. Um, we, I want to talk about two more things um, really quick. One is um, sometimes my colleague Brian Harvey, many of you know, um, he doesn't believe in comments in his code. And he believes that you should name your variables and your functions and your procedures um, so well that you never have to comment. Like the code itself is self-documenting. Um, so in some sense, the pseudocode you're writing, which turns into a block, that's your code. You, know, you wrote it in English, what it's supposed to do, and it reads like an English sentence. This huge, long block name works. Um, so he actually argues, don't put comments in, because um, you often have, you know, you make a change, and now the comments don't match the code, and you have this now inconsistent piece of piece there. So he always argues, have a single source of truth. The code should be it. You should be able to read the code like English, like pseudocode. So sometimes it goes back to the same loop of, 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 of feeling that. And the last one is, uh, flow charting is tough because sometimes um, many of the programs my, our students are writing are in Snap, uh, and they are event-driven. You know, if you're writing a really interesting game, you've got five sprites, and each sprite does this, and it's not a single flow of control. So if you had a you know, an algorithms class, you have one flow of control, what's happening, or oh, looping here, blah, blah, blah. And maybe there are some parts of that. But in, 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 the, in the abstract, it's really hard to write a flow, a, a flow chart to, to, to describe what's happening in a very engaged Snap, Scratch, uh, App Inventor e project where it's so event-driven, right, where so many things are happening on click, on sprites hitting each other. It kind of how do you write the flow chart for that? So that, that's often a challenge. And again, one of the reasons we don't do it. And now that I'm thinking about it and still have the, still have the conch, um, I, we do do it in this one really small part of our course. I'm realizing it that we added like the fifth year we taught the course. The first five years never did it. Many of you know um, Nick Parlante's outstanding nifty assignments, and we grab one of the nifty assignments called Evil Hangman. It's the idea that the person who's playing Hangman with you is changing the word uh, dynamically so that he's always he or she is always dodging it. You know, so you say A E I O U, and they always say no. You're like, wait, how's that possible? Because that particular time, you didn't say why yet, so they were thinking of only why words, and then moving it around. So we asked our students to just change, you know, assignment two is do hangman, and assignment three is to do evil hangman. Um, we had students get, have trouble kind of wrapping their mind, how would you even start? So we decided to scaffold that by giving them, drum roll please, a flow chart. Kind of how you might think about the flow in this very complicated kind of big system. And so in that sense, we did, we did do that to kind of scaffold that one particular problem. But again, we didn't even teach them how to read it. We just kind of looked at it and, and it, you know, do this, make a choice, go left and right. We kind of, people can kind of read that without um, that. So we never taught them how to read it, but we gave them to them as a scaffold to help that particular problem. I'm done. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, Dan. Uh, Grant, um, I noticed your hand was raised. I also noticed your comments out there. Would you like to speak? Would you be able to? Can you try? I'm going to try and speak for Grant, and then maybe Grant, if you are able to speak, I would love for you. I, we all would love to hear you. Um, uh, Melissa says that you are unmuted. Can you try it for a second, sir? Otherwise, I will definitely read what you have stated. Okay. 
So Grant says, I have done basic state diagrams when teaching App Inventor as students understand states and events. That being said, I like the CSP reference sheet. Basic Python works well with flowcharts, but App Inventor, I never use them. So that's interesting. Uh, and certainly, you know, I would even think in uh, things like App Inventor anyway being a block based, flowcharts may not be even essential. Um, Michael had a question. Is there a difference between pseudocode as a strict thing and just planning out an algorithm before you start solving a problem? I've seen students do this in their own voice and it can help for complex problems. Absolutely, right Michael? I have to say that that's my way of problem solving and I certainly encourage it in my APCSA class. Um, so accurately, the question, Mark, I'd love for you to take this one, sir. Where do others see a difference between pseudocode and something more loose? Something loose? What do you mean? I don't, I don't quite understand the question. So I'll repeat it. I think all he means is something not as structured as the pseudocode, like using very specific, uh, like a repeat command or uh, equal to sign. Someone writing in loose English is what I think he says. Uh, I'll repeat the question. Where does, uh, where do others see a difference between pseudocode and something more loose? I think that it makes a, that there's a place for writing out using English what you think you want the program to do. I think that makes sense. Um, I don't like the idea of using a pseudocode in an intro course because the, the, the biggest challenge in learning to program is learning what's called the notional machine. To build a mental model in your computer, in your, in your mind about how the computer works so that when you see a piece of code, you can predict what the computer will do with it, that you can write code and know what it, you, can, you can understand what's going to happen when the computer sees that code. Um, the, the, in the research community, we refer to that as building the notional machine. And the, the, the challenge when using pseudocode or flowchart is that you're not facing the notional machine. You're facing what you, what you think might happen. Roy P., uh, one of the most famous uh, uh, computer scientists involved in computing education research uh, d has been doing work since the, uh, since the 1980s in this space. He refers to the, the biggest challenge that students have to learn to program is the superbug. And the superbug is that deep inside the computer, there's a human being who's trying to understand my words. And that's not true. And it takes most of a first semester to really realize, no, the computer isn't trying to understand you. Um, it's just a machine, and it's just following the notation that you're specifying for it. Pseudocode and flowcharts don't help you grapple with that. I, too, I do understand the role of using pseudocode and flowcharts for solving complicated problems, for, for doing design. But I'm not convinced that there's a role for really complicated problems for, for talking about design, particularly object-oriented design, in the CS Principles classroom, in the course for students with no background to just get them started. I'd rather them play with a friendly environment like SNAP, an environment designed for them to be able to do either top-down programming or bottom-up bricolure tinkering. I think there's a really good place for tinkering and coming to understand a notional machine for developing a mental model about how the computer works. Excellent, Mark. Thank you Probably so more much. than you were looking for, Deepa. But, but oh, no, 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 no. This is perfect. I think it uh, really did give a very good insight and it generated a lot of conversation uh, and had everybody thinking. And it certainly has me thinking about the whole idea of a notional language. Uh, Jill, I'd like for you to, I know when you and I were talking earlier, and you and I go way back for the last five years, thanks to CS principles, you've told me so much, which I'd like for you to share with the audience. Is there a teaching strategy, methodology, or technique that you would recommend using to teach problem solving, algorithm development, using pseudocode or flowcharts? Is that for me? Yes, ma'am. Is that Jill? Yeah. Okay. Okay, I thought you did, but then I thought maybe I heard something. Um, <laughs> gosh, I mean, algorithms, I mean, there's so many different ways 
that I try to tackle that because um, I try to do, I, I try to model the, I mean, I have to go so much farther back. So I think, you know, Dan and Mark have, you know, students, you know, at the college level. So, you know, I have 10th graders and maybe 11th graders. And so um, I try to tackle this in a variety of ways until I find something that sticks. So um, for algorithms, I do things like, um, you know, moving a Lego minifigure on a grid and writing an algorithm to have him move from point A over here to point B. And I model that activity after um, one of the questions, the sample questions in the, um, the CSP curriculum framework. So um, just literally writing go forward three times and turn right, you know, to the left, you know, turn right or turn left, and then go forward. That's one way I teach algorithms. Um, I teach it with um, origami. Um, I teach it with um, playing board games and, you know, moving um, board game items. So, and and then eventually, obviously, we get to Snap. And I also do Python. The two languages that I do in my principal's class are Snap and Python. And between those two things. Um, some students want to do text language, so I introduce Python, and I try to, um, I, taught, I teach concepts. So like for the last two or three weeks, we've been doing loops. So we did lots of looping in Python, and um, I modeled many things, and then we played with things together, and then we did them in Snap, and then the students choose which program they would like to do um, a couple of projects for me in. So um, because I don't want to restrict them to something, you know, some students just really like text-based and others really feel comfortable um, with the, the friendly environment of, of SNAP. And then I also this year have had some kids wanting to do pencil code. So some have done that. So um, for algorithms, I think any way that you can get students breaking down a set of instructions into functioning parts is, you know, a great option, you know, whether it's, um, you know, putting together an origami or, um, you know, moving a robot on some kind of a grid or doing, um, you know, some math project problems, um, you know, with the computer, I think that's helpful. Um, sometimes we flow charted those and sometimes we haven't had to. Um, I think that again goes back to what's your group like? Can they visualize in their mind, you know, what are the parts of doing this and, and what are not. So um, those are my strategies or kind of the, the way that I start out and move forward. So I'll Mark and Dan. This is awesome. Um, lots of conversation going on here. Um, Leah, I did see you say you wanted to comment, but I could not really get that. Um, but if you need me to put something out here, I'll be able to call out and maybe you can even get the mic so that you can speak. Um, I would like to move on to the next question here. Um, Mark? So what does research tell us about the use of pseudocode or flowchart in an introduction to computer science course? So um, I, I already mentioned the, notion, the importance of developing a notional machine. Um, the biggest challenge that we have in using things like pseudocode and flowchart is the problem of transfer. Getting students to recognize that it's the same activity in both the pseudocode and in the programming language that, that they're using. Um, it's like the, there was this really great research that um, it's now been replicated. It was work that was done with uh, Modi Ben-Ari in, uh, in Israel and was just recently replicated at Clemson. Um, where students used CS Unplugged, um, and afterward, middle school students, uh, middle school students in Israel, and then high school students in the U.S., um, it didn't have any impact on their learning about computer science at all. In fact, the students, for the most part, didn't realize that what they were learning had anything to do with algorithms or programming. Um, it's hard to get people to transfer. Uh, John Anderson at Carnegie Mellon University did a series of really fascinating studies looking at how students learning, this is old research, so you can recognize by the names of the programming languages, how students learning LISP could then transfer that knowledge into Pascal. 
or um, from, from Pascal to Prolog. And he found that it's actually really difficult to get students to transfer their knowledge from one programming language to the next. Um, most people who, who know Pascal and Lisp will say, oh, well, there, there's a lot of similarities between them. There are, but it takes a great deal of expertise to recognize those similarities. For a novice, seeing more than one programming language in a short period of time when they're first getting started can actually inhibit them their learning because they get what's called negative transfer. They get confused about what things work in which kind of notation. Um, I, I, I just recently published a book on uh, learner-centered design of computing education, a research on computing for everyone, where I talk about um, a theory, of, of a learning theory called situated learning that suggests that, that most people, when they're, when they're trying to learn something, they're inspired to join a community of practice. Um, most of the people here on the call, um, when you wanted to, to, to learn how to teach, you didn't necessarily want to learn how to teach because you were fascinated by learning. You did because you saw what teachers did and you liked what teachers did and, and you, saw, you shared the values of teachers. You wanted to be a member of a community of practice of teaching. Um, think about that in terms of programming languages like SNAP or Python. There are people that use those. You could say, hey, don't you want to become a great SNAP programmer like uh, Dan Garcia and Brian Harvey? Would you like to be like those? Um, and that, that inspires students, that, that notion of a community of practice and role models. That's missing when we're talking about pseudocode. People don't, as a professional practice, except for computer science theorists, work in terms of pseudocode. Um, there is a community of practice around UML. Uh, Object-oriented designers use the, the unified modeling language all the time. We teach UML here at Georgia Tech. I taught it for many years in our object-oriented design class. But object-oriented design goes way beyond the first semester. Um, so what the research tells us about the use of pseudocode or flowcharts is that it may play a role in teaching design, but it can be really confusing to an intro student when they first get started. It's not clear what transfers from the use of pseudocode or flowchart into the actual programming language, and there may be negative transfer. And finally is that it may not be inspiring or motivating to students if there isn't an obvious community of practice for those who use pseudocode and flowcharts. I have to agree, um, uh, Mark, with especially the part that the rewarding. One of the things that when I was thinking about this is when we write a program and it works somewhat, and then we get a compile error, or we get a runtime error, or a raw logical error, then we want to go and fix it immediately. And then we fix it, we build it, it works, we do it again and again, and that iterative process is what's engaging the feedback that the computer gives us. When you're doing it with a flowchart or writing a pseudocode on paper, that excitement is reduced, and in some ways, that can actually be demotivating to a student. So, good point. Um, I did want to point out something that Grant said here. Every time I, I try to provide a flowchart on a test, or ask students to create a flowchart, it does not go well. In class, jointly building a flowchart works much better, I find. So that's really interesting, I think, to understand and or to listen to somebody's experience where flowchart students don't perform well. So uh, this has been a very engaging, interactive conversation. Uh, and it almost feels like we are all in the same room, just sitting down and chatting. And I really appreciate the uh, uh, ch chat sessions going on and the interaction between the panelists. Uh, Diane, Jill, want to comment on question four before I move on to question five? No, I, I think Mark covered it. Great. No, I, I don't have anything to add. Thanks, Pope. Awesome, very nicely done. Question five. So if you're teaching CS principles to prepare students to take the AP CS principles exam, how do you recommend that a pseudocode reference sheet be used to prepare the students? My thoughts are for this one, I'd like to listen to everybody who on on ideas. As a teacher, I, I find myself a little challenged. 
how, how exactly am I going to make the student successful on this? And so, audience, please, we're going to ask our esteemed panelists to speak first. But if, as you put down your comments uh, or ask your questions, I'd like for this to be one of the most interactive questions because it's honestly very important for us teachers to take back and understand how to train our students for the exam. Dan, would you like to go first, sir? Sure, thank you. I'd be delighted. Um, well, the first is, I think the worst thing that we could do is, is recommend that people teach the pseudocode reference sheet all year. Um, there was even some worry, uh, this is outside the development committee, that people might might decide that that's the language that, because it's on the exam, is the language that students should be interacting with all year. And that's, that's really, that's so tail wagging dog. You want to engage in a wonderful, you know, multimedia rich language, App Inventor, Snap, Scratch, lots of them are out there. To be able to have the students make a really, really awesome, fun project that, that engages them and has sounds and pictures that they've scanned or use from their phone, all those things. Um, so I, I'd hate for people to think that it's the right thing to do is to, to, to take the pseudocode reference sheet and use it as their main language. Um, I would love to see folks uh, like, like our, ourselves in the SNAP group and App Inventor group and Scratch group um, make translations, um, make kind of an equivalencies so that as we're, as you know, the course is up, and now it's time to start reviewing for the exam, and you're in the last two weeks of, of late April and May, um, and you're thinking about how to prepare your students best, I would love to see folks, and I'm committing the SNAP team to, to do this, and I'm happy to do this on my own as well, um, to make a translation document that says, when you see this piece, this piece of code in the reference sheet, here's the SNAP that you already know. When you see this, here's this snap that you already know. So kind of making sure that um, folks are successful to transfer, Mark talked about transfer, to transfer the ideas that they already know into these reference sheet uh, constructs. And in the rare cases where the language they're working with does not, uh, certainly the language will have be a superset of what the reference sheet is. As a reference sheet is kind of an intersection, so it's a minimalist language. Um, but when there are cases where the reference sheet has something that the student may not have seen, and this was a concern as we were thinking of the reference sheet in the first place. You know, what if the student is working in a functional language and really thinks functionally about everything, doesn't think about anything but, you know, one return value and, you know, a comp composition of complex expressions. Um, the reference sheet is a, you know, is a sequential language. So that's a, that might be a hard lift for that, for that group of students. And that's, that's one of the difficulties of trying to find a minimal set that really is, is, is capturing most of the language people are using. So I would say, wait till the last two weeks, bring a, you know, make sure that the SNAP and Scratch and App Inventor folks have created this document and use that as you're starting to go through practice questions. You know, oh, I get it, that's the same as this. Oh, yeah, this isn't so different after all. Uh, uh, constructs, and they also have blocked constructs. And really block is just a picture on the text. But it lets students who've been working in block languages kind of be comfortable if they're used to seeing shapes. You know, the if block has has the inner part of the if, the inner block of the if, be inside it. So it kind of looks like it's a big C. Uh, so that can connect more with the folks who've been block-based and not, don't have to kind of think text-based. Because a lot of folks, there was a concern who were doing nothing but block languages and gave them only text exam, they, they it might be disadvantaged. So there is kind of being a mix of block and text but I would say wait to the end and use these translation sheets that I hope that all the language developers create. Thanks, Dan. That's excellent. Um, there is a question here from Jean. Um, she shows a arrow pointing to A5 and asking, will the CSP exam taker see the pseudocode as shown on the reference sheet? The answer is yes. And to reiterate what Jill says, and the reference sheet will be provided with the test. So the students will have the reference sheet, and yes, there will be questions based on that reference sheet in the exam. <clears throat> there are two other comments. Um, I'm not sure. It sounds, looks like an a abbreviation of a name. I have found using live code, which is essentially a pseudocode-like language, transforms well to Java and Python. And Rob, Robert says, Regarding multiple languages, if they are linked, like blockly based, it's a matter of managing complexity in an upward spiral. 
Uh, Jill, do you want to be able to take this question, ma'am, and tell us uh, from the teacher perspective, how do you recommend that a pseudocode reference should be used in the classroom? Sure, thank you, Deepa. Um, in my classroom, I have used the reference sheet during the year as we've taught, as we've gone through different programming concepts. So I've sort of kept abreast of, you know, we've covered this and we've covered this concept. Um, I have not necessarily hidden it from my class. Every now and then I'll mention something about it, but I have not distributed it to them. My plan is essentially to do what Dan had just spoken about. Um, after we finish doing the create performance task in about March, end of March, we come back from spring break, I plan to give the class the exam reference sheet and literally um, my plan actually is to take my class and divide them into collaborative teams and each team will take, you know, one concept from the exam reference sheet, whether it's declaring a variable or um, doing a control statement or doing a um, something with a list and either they will find examples that they have done, create an example in SNAP and so that we together build our um, kind of repository of examples from here's what's on the reference sheet, here's what this looks like that we've already done this year, here's an example of where we did this in class, don't you remember? And then I can then publish that out, you know, print it out, ever how they want to do it. Most of them don't want anything printed. So um, that's one idea. And then the students can um, present, you know, their little section of the exam reference sheet to kind of connect what we've already done with um, what they might be asked. And um, I also hope that each group can come up with a couple of sample questions. And then that would give us, you know, maybe a, a a class set of some sample questions that I could then publish out and we could kind of, you know, round robin with each other. So that's my plan is to do, you know, essentially what Dan said, but um, I've used it in my preparation to make sure that I've covered everything that students would know, and um, but I have not taught from it and I have not introduced it to them yet because I do feel like that it looks different than, than the languages that, that we've seen. So it might be a little bit confusing, but I think on the looking at the coding in the rearview mirror, but yet seeing the exam reference sheet, I think it'll make plenty of sense. You know, like once you get where you're going and you look at the directions or the map, it makes total sense how you got there. So I definitely think it's something to look at on the the um, the exam prep part of a class, not necessarily you know from day one. And I would not teach to it because I think that would definitely be. Um, less interesting than um, literally digging into a programming language. So that's my idea. Could I jump in here, Deepa? Please. Yeah, please. So um, I, I strongly suggest doing just as, as, as Jill is describing, um, as, as Dan's pointing out, the test is going to be in the code on the reference sheet. And um, I, I see that, that uh, Gene and Michael are talking about perhaps the College Board could provide language-specific translation sheets. So here's how SNAP maps to the pseudocode. Here's how uh, App Inventor maps to the pseudocode. Um, I think that would be a great idea. I can't speak for the College Board. I don't know if they would do that. But I did want to tell a short story. Um, I had a student, Allison Elliott, too, who developed a language-independent test of CS knowledge. Uh, she called it the FCS1. And she used pseudocode on the test for the same reason that the College Board is using pseudocode on the CS Principles exam. They, they want to be language agnostic, but they want to ask questions about programs and have students talk about programs. So they provide, they, they've defined a pseudocode. So Allison found, and she tested her pseudocode with students who worked in uh, Java, Python, and MATLAB. Um, she hadn't tested with a box-based language. We don't know much about that yet. Um, and uh, it, it generally worked that students, they took two tests. They took a test in their native language, and then they took it, you know, whatever, Java, MATLAB, or Python, and they took a test in the pseudocode. And for the most part, the scores were, were very close, which gave her confidence that, that the pseudocode worked. But the, the key idea is that for the most part, she broke down the, the scores, the correlations between how well students did on the native test and how they did on the pseudocode test. And it turns out that the very best students map very cleanly. 
the very worst students had the biggest gap. They had the hardest time taking the knowledge that they had developed in whatever language they had learned and transferring it into the pseudocode of the exam, which suggests that a pseudocode-based exam actually biases the scores in favor of the students who have the greatest knowledge already. Everybody's going to have some trouble mapping their, their whatever language they learned to the pseudocode. But the students who are already doing the best at their native language, they're going to find the easiest tongue to match the pseudocode. If students are still struggling with uh, SNAP, App Inventor, Scratch, Python, whatever it is that they're learning, they're going to have the most difficult time transferring the pseudocode. So it is definitely in your students' interest for you to spend some time helping the students to become familiar with the pseudocode, to do just as Joe, I think that what Jill's describing sounds really smart, as a way of mapping the things that they've done already in their native programming language, whatever language they've learned through most of the course, and helping them map it to the pseudocode. I think that's a really important strategy. That's outstanding. This is exciting. Uh, believe it or not, folks, all three of them have never even met uh, all three of them together and spoken, but it's amazing how they all seem to think and think very similarly. That just shows that we seem to be going in the right direction. I did want to mention something that Mandy had put out here. Uh, I'm very excited that everyone seems to be moving towards understanding that learning about programming is not language specific. Right, and that's a big, big goal of CS principles. So yes, I do think that emphasis and that point of getting that across, not just to our students, but to the community, to our parent community, to our school community, to our other principals and other teachers of other subjects, would be very important. Um, great. Um, we are very close to finishing. We have just about four minutes left. I'd like to open up the floor for further comments, questions. To our, to our amazing panelists, you will all agree with me that uh, we couldn't have had a more, more interactive webinar with, with all of them talking and engaging each other. So questions, I'd open up the floor for questions for a couple of minutes, maybe two. Oh, there you go. Um, I see. I'm looking to see if there are any questions out there. Hey, um, can I throw something just in response to Robert Uranich's okay. comment um, on block to text transitions? I recommend looking at the work that Ben Shapiro is doing with Blocky Talk. Um, most, when we think about block to text transitions, we often think about them as just being uh, a syntactic transition. But Ben's been noting that it's not really. I mean, text languages actually have much more sophisticated semantics than most block-based languages as well. And so it's important to think about how do you help students to transition not just the syntax, blocks to text, but also helping them to think about there's all kinds of syntax affordances in blocks that then go away, and you have to figure out how to deal with that when you get to text. So I recommend Ben's work at, at University of Colorado Boulder on that. Great, great. And uh, Mark, I want to go ahead and uh, just what you have stated here, because I do think, from my own personal experience, I did not go language independent. My very first programming language was Fortran. I now can translate from one language to the other very easily, but I did need it to be one language. So I want to put out Mark's comment here that he disagrees that uh, becoming programming language independent is maybe not the first language approach. Learning about programming is a very language specific once you have learned about programming, that knowledge can transfer to other languages, but not when first learning programming. At this point, it is highly language specific. You know, it's important to present that point of view too. Um, Melissa, we are just about a minute away from 8.30. Um, I'd like to give a hand over the floor to Melissa, but not before taking a minute to thank Mark, Dan, and Jill for, for an outstanding webinar. I know this is one of the most useful ones for 
our teachers and eventually for our students and the growth of our subject. I also would like to give a shout out to uh, Melissa Raspberry from the AIR. Uh, Melissa has very instrumental in making these webinars successful and the entire CS10K community become very active and collaborative and leading to a lot of discussions. So without further talk, I'd like to hand the floor back to Melissa. Thank you, Deepa, and you were you did just what I was about to do and give an absolute um, sincere thanks to all of you for being here with us. Um, Deepa is our host, Mark, Dan, and Jill is our panelist, as well as all of you that have been in the audience. And um, your questions in the chat window, it's, I, I've, I've had a tough time keeping up. It's been so great, but a very, very rich discussion. We did just want to encourage you to continue this conversation on the CSMK community. We're going to post something in the CSP open group as a follow-up to this. If you're not follow us, following us on Twitter, we also invite you to do that, um, at CS10K. And then we've started hosting monthly CS10K Twitter chats, the fourth Monday. So we actually just had one last night, and the next one will be slated, I believe it's February 22nd, it's the fourth Monday. We have three webinars coming up already on the calendar in February, one around the kind of makerspace movement and how to use that and kind of uh, low impact tools in the CS classroom, that's on February 10th. Um, February 16th, there's one on ECS, um, but frankly it could also be, I think it could be broadened to you guys too about thinking about how to broaden participation. And then finally on the 29th, on Leap Day, we're having one um, with Emmanuel Swanser from um, Bootstrap, who's going to do one around programming is like math, right? Um, so we'll hope you join us for one of these events and stay connected with us. And again, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. We appreciate you being here, and we hope you all have a great rest of your evening. Take care, guys. Thank you.